Folks, our first panel this morning, one of the most impressive, I think, of the entire day, uh, is uh, on the theme of law enforcement for Canada's law reform. Many of you are certainly aware of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, the organization which came into being a few years back, several years ago, I guess now, and consists of people who either presently or formerly worked in law enforcement. Um, Tony Ryan, uh, one of the speakers on this panel, uh, is a member of and representative of LEAP, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Uh, he'll be speaking again later today in addition to his remarks on this panel this morning. Um, we also, uh, Travis Noble is, is not with us as yet, but uh, my good friend Travis Noble, one of the uh, most uh, impressive criminal defense attorneys in St. Louis, served for seven years as the head of a narcotic squad out of town in the state of Maine before returning to St. Louis, attending law school, and now fighting the good fight. We do expect Travis will be with us uh, either during this panel or shortly after this panel. Uh, we also have on the panel Mr. David Rosen, a former assistant United States attorney, and uh, we certainly welcome him and uh, appreciate uh, his perspective on the need to reform marijuana laws, and, uh, and Mr. Gary Weger who, uh, as many of you are aware, uh, attempted to be our lobbyist on behalf of Show Me Cannabis Regulation, uh, and uh, in fact is lobbying unpaid at this point, but nonetheless uh, working uh, for positive law reform in the Missouri General Assembly while he and his attorney litigate a federal civil rights case against the St. Louis Police Department for attempting to silence him, for attempting to violate his First Amendment rights. Uh, and I believe uh, John's going to uh, moderate this panel, so I'll turn it over to John at this point. Is this, all right, that is very much on. All right, <laughs> so uh, just like to uh, have all of you guys uh, real quick just say a bit about your experiences as members of law enforcement and ask what was it uh, uh, that made you eventually come to realize that we need massive change to our, uh, to our cannabis laws. I'm Dave Rosen. I was an assistant U.S. attorney here from 1975 until 2008. And I came into the office opposed to the drug laws. Uh, actually, John heard me speak somewhere else and heard me explain that when I was offered the job, I told the U.S. attorney, who was a conservative Republican, that I didn't believe in the drug laws and I didn't want to prosecute any drug cases. And I'd do anything else and don't hire me if, if that's unacceptable. And he hired me, and I didn't do drug cases. Uh, the belief just comes from reading history and having some degree of intelligence. Prohibition doesn't work. If you have a popular vice, you can't legislate against it. It fails. And every single thing that prohibition taught us happened with drug enforcement. You have a disrespect for law enforcement which comes from the unpopularity of what we're doing. Police officers, legislators, prosecutors, all can be bribed. There's unlimited money on the other side. Uh, you also have officers who see the situation that you know, the, the drug dealers have tons of money, why shouldn't I take it? You engender corruption. And the human price, we're, we're criminalizing conduct that probably shouldn't be criminal. We're sending people to jail who don't need to be there. And it, it's just pointless. It's not going to solve any problem. In my mind, it was also inconsistent. We have tobacco, which we know is bad. We subsidize its growth. We have alcohol, which is a poison that we ingest. And we allow people to advertise that sporting events to our young kids. But marijuana and other drugs, we treat differently. Mm. Uh, you know, I, nothing I saw in my law enforcement experience changed any of those views whatsoever. If anything, they reinforced it. I was the civil rights prosecutor here for 25 years, among my other jobs. And I prosecuted police officers who were involved in corrupt activities surrounding drugs. They were corrupted by the laws that were supposed to protect us. Uh, my name is Gary Wigert. I am a St. Louis City Police Officer. I have been for 32 years, 11 months. And so I always have to start off with a disclaimer. Uh, any comments made by me here are solely my comments and are not the official comments of the St. Louis Police Department. And 
and I'm sure some of you have followed that uh, I was hired uh, as a lobbyist. I've been lobbying down Jefferson City since uh, 97, really, with the uh, police union. And so right now, uh, my department, although they did approve me to work secondary, uh, I didn't mention who my clients were. I don't think that's their business. But uh, once they found out who uh, the client was, uh, my secondary was pulled. And uh, basically, uh, as a police officer, I I've seen a number of marijuana arrests we put out here. I've made uh, hundreds of marijuana arrests in my time. I've made thousands of drug arrests. Um, I see people who uh, knock the little old lady down for the purse. That's to support a heroin habit, a meth habit, uh, a cocaine habit. Nobody, nobody does a burglary. Nobody robs a little old lady for marijuana. And I think that's a real important thing out here to, to uh, uh, differentiate between marijuana drug use and some of these other drugs. Uh, so I don't have a problem with, uh, I know that will upset some of the libertarian friends around here, but uh, some of these other drugs cause the major crime. Uh, I do not see that with marijuana. And also in law enforcement, I've seen uh, what happens with, uh, we become addicted ourselves, law enforcement becomes addicted to seizing the money. And that's what a lot of this is about, is the asset forfeiture laws. People here from St. Louis saw the uh, scandal involved in the towing scandal. Um, that was involving asset forfeiture. That was under the guise of asset forfeiture that we basically took people's cars. You, you might want to explain a little bit about that. Is that oh, sure there are some people um, that what happened was our law, the way we interpreted our laws here was that if you were driving a car and you were committing a felony, we seized your cars. And I think we seized something like 11,000 or 12,000 cars, and I think we seized two. But what happened was the bill, you know, you would tow the car, we'd hold the car, each day you'd rack up $100 in costs for storage fees and for the tow. Well, people couldn't afford to buy their car back, so the longer it would sit there, the more the bill would go up. And so what would happen would be uh, the tow company would sell the, sell the car to themselves, they had a tow lot, and then they would go ahead and sell the, uh, these folks' cars. So we were it was basically a racket to make the tow company some money. Uh, this this is even stranger. If you put we had a problem with temporary plates. People didn't want to register their cars. They didn't want to pay the taxes on it. So they put temporary plates on their cars. And so what they would we do is we would we would charge them with forgery because they forged the uh, temporary plate. I mean it's kind of a stretch that it becomes a felony that you have temporary plates on your car. But under that guise we took people's cars and we towed them. And a lot of folks weren't able to uh, get their cars back. So that was a big scandal here uh, that was involving the chief's uh, daughter. Uh, she had a uh, cocaine problem. Uh, she was getting cars uh, that were seized from somebody else with cocaine. And she was also getting locked up and wrecking her cars. And so she was continuously getting cars from this tow lot. So that was basically the problem with the forfeiture. And what, I, what most people don't know is the state of Missouri addressed this a while back ago where the money goes to some type of school fund. Um, I'm not all that up on it, but that's the state of Missouri. And so what we do is now when we seize money, it goes to the federal government comes. Instead of it going to the school fund, the federal government comes and we give it to them. They keep 20% and they kick back 80% to the local jurisdiction. And so that's, I mean, that's how we bought this new uh, building down here on Olive. Uh, new police building. We bought that with asset forfeiture funds. It funds a lot of things out here. And I, I tell a little story to folks. Uh, when I was uh, up, up in the 6th District, up off of Goodfellow, I remember one time I was called, uh, met uh, another jurisdiction. They had a consent to search, to search this house. They didn't have a warrant, they had a consent to search. And they showed up with eight police officers and a uh, drug dog. And it was either U City or Berkeley or one of these places out, uh, one of the county municipalities. So we show up and they knock on the door and in they go and next thing I know they leave with the money, they leave with the drugs, and then we're left with writing a report and the prisoner. And I really have no idea to this day what they seized or what they didn't seize. But what happens is and uh, they want that money because if you seize that money, no matter what jurisdiction, it's yours. And then we have also things like uh, the highway uh, interdiction. Uh, the highways everywhere else, uh, highway patrol patrol, uh, uh, patrols the highways. Here in St. Louis, that doesn't happen. St. Louis City patrols these highways. And I believe the reason is, is because if we have a drug, let's face it, uh, 44 and 55 are pipelines up to Chicago and various places to convey drugs. 
Well, we want those forfeitures is what we're looking for. So we patrol the highways. So that way, if we make one of those hits on those highways and we seize a lot of money, it then goes to our police department. So I think these are things that need to, uh, people need to find out about this and we need to know. And so things like that have, have, have uh, led to a change in my beliefs. Um, uh, I also uh, uh, support the four bills that we have currently uh, down in Jefferson City, and I'm sure we'll address that later on. So thank you. Thank you. Come on, let's, let's do better for Sergeant Gray Weaver. <laughs> He's a hero in my book, okay? He's standing up for what's right while he's still on duty. And I know personally for a lot of active duty police officers, mostly wearing the uniform, driving the marked car, doing the real police work, and what I call the real police work, that think the same way. But uh, as this man is experiencing to some extent, it's hard for them to say so. But they just should not be bothered. They want to they do what cops are for, and that's answer the calls for service and get there as soon as they can get there. Help the people that are actually having a problem who think that they're calling because they have an emergency, whether it's a real emergency by definition or not, they think it is. That's why they call. Anyway, my name is Tony Ryan. I'm a retired lieutenant from the Denver Police Department, 36 years there, 30 of it in uniform. They put me in captivity at headquarters for about five years where I was called an accident investigator. I reconstructed the really bad accidents for a while, which was kind of gruesome, but also kind of a challenge do some of the math and all that. Can't do it these days, cars are completely different, but it's uh, one of my sidelines that I did in the police department. A um, couple of things that early on in my career made me think, what is this drug war all about? And why do we do it this way? Why can't we deal with this in a different way? One of those was um, one of our narcotics officers had a girlfriend who worked in what we call the property bureau, it's where evidence and recovered personal property from burglaries and so forth was kept. That was his girlfriend. She also had access to the drugs that were seized and narcotic rates and all that. She was smuggling them out of the property bureau, giving them to her narcotics detective boyfriend, and he was selling the stuff. And I thought, wow, well, this stuff really is corrupted. This guy's out there trying to make a little more money. And uh, I actually participated in arresting him and sending the fellow cop to prison. Last I heard, the best they can do is sell used cars. And I thought, what a waste, what a waste for, uh, for a little bit of money and for, the, for yielding to temptation. So there was that. When I was a lieutenant, quite a few years later, patrol lieutenant, we had uh, a higher level commander that decided the patrol division ought to be more involved in drug enforcement activity, not just a narcotics unit, as if we had the time. But you know, so they were taking very young police officers, barely out of the academy, and trying to make them uh, drug enforcers, and they were trying to develop informants and all that, and we had a guy that thought he had uh, an angle on somebody for like a little bit of marijuana, and they were going to point out a house to him where they sold drugs and all that, and he pointed to a house, and he went and got a search warrant based on who knows what, and they got called a SWAT team, because our SWAT team did all the, uh, the entries on warrants. They kicked in this house, they found a lone man in there who was from Mexico, and while he was uh, not exactly legally here, he wasn't doing anything because it was the wrong address. But he thought that the reason he left Mexico was there were some people after him, and he thought they'd found him. And he had a gun, and he pulled the gun, and didn't fire any shots, but he ended up dead. And you know, they still talk about that case. Some 15 years later, it'll come up once in a while, and they decide to like, hammer the police department for something they never see. And then there was this case, you know. So I mean, the, those two things, that is if the first one wasn't bad enough. Um, just told me that we have to find a better way to deal with this system. When you look at other countries, and I'll probably talk more about this this evening, but when you look at other countries uh, who have a different program, where people who get themselves in trouble with drugs are free to walk in and say, I have a problem, and they help. In this country, more often than not, we just put them in prison, where they can get all the drugs they want, or even not want, they're there. And prison guards in this country are being arrested somewhere every month for selling drugs to prisoners. Our policy has a problem. So about, about 12 years ago, five police officers, former police officers, a couple of them former narcs, decided this is Mickey Mouse, we have to do something about it, and they formed a league. And I heard about them the year after I retired, and I said, I have to join this group because they believe what I believe, and that is that this whole thing is a travesty. 
we need to find a better way to deal with the drug problem instead of making it worse. Uh, before I move on to the next question, I believe our fourth panelist uh, actually just arrived, uh, Travis Nobley, is that you back there? You, if you want to come on up, we've only started, uh, just started the panel, so you can go ahead and join this one, or, or speak later. Your, your, your call. Come on up, Travis. Come on. Or it's not your call. Dan, Dan will make the call for you. <laughs> but yeah, since you weren't here when, when I asked the question, basically just uh, talk about your experience uh, as a law enforcement officer and uh, how this actually led you to uh, reject uh, the way we currently treat marijuana. And I know uh, you're probably the only one on the panel that was actually a narcotics officer, so that's a, a, of an interesting perspective even, even on this panel. So if you could talk a little bit about that. Well, I was in law enforcement for about 10 years. I was a beat cop for five, and I was a drug agent for almost six. Um, when I was 30, went to law school and became a defense lawyer. Um, you know, from a selfish standpoint, I thank God I hope they don't ever legalize this because that makes so much damn money. Um, because legalizing it's going to take all the profit out of it. You know, you legalize, you're going to cut down on the issues. I'm representing, getting ready to try a case over in East St. Louis where my clients get caught with 2,000 pounds of marijuana and a million dollars in cash. It's hard. I, I probably don't have a usable amount argument in this case. So, got a big family? He's got a really big family. Um, and, I mean, it's going to be a tough case. And, and the fact that we're putting people in prison and incarcerating people is ridiculous for marijuana. Now, I always tell people, all these teeth are fake. Every one was knocked out when I was a police officer. Every one of them, the guy, every person ever punched me in the mouth was drunk. I've never been punched once by somebody who was smoking weed. Never once. Um, it just makes no sense um, that marijuana is not legal. But it's coming. I mean, I really believe, you know, in my children's lifetime, they're going to look at this. I mean, it's kind of like the gay marriage issue. Both of them, at some point, people are going to go, huh, really? That was illegal? It's kind of like, you know, within my lifetime, it was against the law for blacks and whites to be married. And I think our kids, at one, my kids at one point are going to go, are you kidding me? Those people did jail for smoking weed. Um, I was young, dumb. My mother was a '60s leftover hippie, like you read about. I mean, toe socks and Birkenstocks and smoking weed in our living room. And of course, every young male rebels, and I rebelled into a little dipshit Alex P. Keaton Republican. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, I was a kid who was like, "Mom, God, please get my hair cut." She's like, "What's wrong with you? Like, what child asked me his haircut?" So all of a sudden I was this little right wing nut job and you know with a picture of Ronald Reagan in my bedroom and I joined the police department when I was 20. And you know, her influence started to weigh on me and I started to realize that this was absolutely ridiculous, this war on drugs, this alleged war on drugs. Um, you know, I liked the people that I was buying from undercover sometimes more than the assholes I was working with. And I say that because it dawned on me at an autopsy. We were, doing, we were at an autopsy for a heroin overdose. And I'm with two other narcotics detectives. And they're making jokes and bullshit the entire time. Sorry for my language. I know it's terrible. I don't think that's what offended him. No, 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 no I know. No, I'm not saying that. I just realized it, how foul my language is. I apologize. Um, you were saying something bad? I think that they were, were sitting there and there's this dead woman. She overdosed from heroin. And they're making jokes. And I said to him, I thought this was the real reason we did this. Like, if it's really that we become narcotics detectives because we think drugs are killing people and ruining people's lives, this is the penultimate of why we do it, right? This woman died. And the truth is, you don't give a shit about her. You don't care. You're looking at it like there's another drum drug at it. That's really the way they looked at it. They didn't care. It almost becomes so routine for us in law enforcement that we forget about what we're, what's really going on. And I said, then the only reason we do this job is because of our egos. Because the federal government gave us some guns, badges, battering rams, we're going to go kick people's doors down. And it really kind of struck me. 
And these guys looked at me and they're like, well, what the hell got an end to you? And it was even so callous to the point where one of the other guys picked up and there was an orange sticker that said, caution, uh, caution AIDS um, prevention or something of that nature. And he unpeeled it and he stuck it on the other guy's back, joking around. I mean, that's how kind of carefree this was. And here's this dead woman. And I think heroin, cocaine are issues that they're medical problems, I came to conclusion. If you got somebody who's addicted to heroin and they're affecting their life and they've lost everything and they're it's a medical issue. It's a medical issue. You know, I had a, a pretty famous client got caught with a bunch of prescription medication, Vicodin. Like and I'm up there talking in the room with my press release. I'm like, it's, he's seeking treatment, and he became addicted to this, you know, narcotic, da da da. And he's in a medical facility now. And the reporter said to me, you know, it's funny. When you're a heroin addict or a cocaine addict, you're a drug addict. When you're poor, you're a drug addict. When you got money, you got a medical problem. You have an addiction. And it's so true. But I think marijuana is in a different, I really do think marijuana is a different category. I don't know of anybody shooting, well, I don't know of anybody who just smoking weed and hanging out on a Friday night who then says, holy shit, we ran out of weed, we need to go rob a bank and get more weed. <laughs> I just don't think that happens in my 26 something years in this business and I've just never seen that happen. Now, is there, is there a violence? I mean, this case I'm about to try, yeah, people have been killed. But that's because of the money involved, not because of the marijuana. There's money involved. When there's a million dollars cash, someone gets shot killed. I don't give a shit if it's over Lego toys. But I definitely think that we're, I mean, I think we're getting there. I think the politicians are starting to come around. I mean... The fact that Obama took him this long to come around is just a joke. I mean, I'm sure behind closed doors he says this is bullshit. You know, but because he wants to get reelected, and, and, and everybody's so tied up in these partisan politics. But I think it's coming around. I don't know in terms of, you know, I mean, I was a former cop, but, you know, and I had a brain. And I just really started thinking about these things. And it struck me in terms of having debates and arguments with the guys that I worked with about why shouldn't this be legal. And there is no good answer. Why should it be illegal? Thank you. That sort of leads into my next question about, uh, you know, you guys all had experience with other officers and uh, other members of law enforcement, and obviously there's not a, exactly a scientific survey out there that we can rely upon to ask uh, how, many, uh, how many members of law enforcement, what percentage support changing the laws, but in your experience, the people that you worked with, uh, when you started talking about this, how many of them, what, you know, what percentage of them came up to you and said, I support you, I can't say it publicly, but I agree with you, and what percentage were like, this is, no, you're, you're, you're going off the reservation here, this is, this is no good. I was, <clears throat> I was labeled the office communist, I didn't convince a lot of people. Uh, I did once have a, a long discussion with the head of the Federal Drug Task Force here about can you make your war work, and eventually got him to acknowledge that no, what he was doing was pointless. But he wouldn't change, because it was his job. Uh, if you're talking about legalization, the people that I worked with would generally be against it. Decriminalization, you'd have some support. But the question you're going to get is, okay, you've decriminalized it, now how, what controls will you have? We treat it like tobacco. We treat it like alcohol, or is it just going to be wide open? But within within the group of people I know, legalization, you wouldn't see hardly anybody saying yeah. When it comes to, uh, you know, we say decrim. I call it downsizing charges. It <laughs> sounds a little better, uh, more appropriate to us. But, you know, it used to be police officers, uh, when I first came on as a policeman, 
uh, if you arrested somebody with marijuana, everybody made fun of you because there was such there was more crime out there, uh, better criminals, I guess is the right term to arrest. So if you came in with a marijuana arrest, you made fun of. But the culture has changed on this because now there's more. Uh, there's, let's see here, what's the word? There's less discretion out there. I don't know if everybody saw the tape. They probably read about it in the news. We had a police woman who stopped a car, and uh, the guy was smoking marijuana in the car. So she gets him out, uh, she searches him, and finds a, a, a marijuana cigarette in his pocket. But she doesn't arrest him, she lets him go. And uh, I'm sure she discarded it or whatever. But there were witnesses in the car, two state senators, and the car was also being she had a camera in the car. So that officer's in trouble now, but that officer did what uh, police officers in the city of St. Louis have been doing for a long time, and that's just discarding the, the small amounts because it's just not worth our time. We're a very busy place in this city, and it just isn't worth our time to do that. But unfortunately now, we've got things like cameras in the cars, so we're actually making more arrests for marijuana because these officers know that it's being filmed. We also have different things like these no-tolerance zones where we lock up someone for every minor charge we can get. And so marijuana becomes a drug arrest, so you make that charge. If you, if you notice a thing called hot spot policing, that's real popular right now, where you saturate an area with police officers, they're looking to arrest you for anything you can, whether it's a bench warrant or small amounts of marijuana or anything they can. So actually our marijuana arrests are going up when you think it would be the opposite, but it's because you have so many different things like these cameras and these gathering statistical numbers. So I think many of the police officers are against this, but um, because of our rules, we enforce it even more. And in private, I would say uh, it's probably, uh, if it came to legalization, it'd probably be about 50-50. But I think when it comes to downsizing charges, I think uh, probably the majority of policemen support that. Fortunately, not all that was going on before I retired. We didn't have cameras and cars in Denver and so forth. But uh, <clears throat> because I let a lot of people go, I said, you know, I made them like throw it out, grind it out in the dirt, and go home. Don't be driving stupid and having the stuff with you. That's double stupid. Until we do something about making it okay, you know. So, but uh, cameras. Remember when people we used to think were weird walking around? They're watching you. Well, they are now. For sure. <laughs> and it does. I mean, I realize that the intent is to make sure that we can show that an officer did everything right. But it does take away a lot of discretion, whether it's giving somebody a break on a ticket. You want to make a point, especially in some neighborhoods, you want to show them that you're not, that you don't just hate them because of where they live, but because you're a fair guy and you just want to give them a warning. And, you know, when I was at, you know, especially as a sergeant and lieutenant, which was most of my career, I didn't care whether the city or the state got any money, I wanted safe drivers. So for a minor violation, I got a chance to make a point and, uh, and show them that it doesn't matter who you are, I just want to give you a break. I just want you to drive a little more safely. So uh, might be a little harder to do that now with the cameras and microphones and so forth. But um, we need to look at this, and uh, it's, just, it's just amazing to me uh, how many police officers are stepping forward and some that are brave enough as a sergeant here while they're still active duty. And there was a study, I can't remember who did the study, but I think I was talking um, with John about it the other day. There's a study that just came out where there's somebody did a survey of 50,000 police officers around the country. No, I'm sorry, 15,000. But from uh, all parts of the country. And the vast majority, or about close to 80%, said, we don't want to enforce marijuana laws. We don't have time for this, just as the sergeant said. And the patrol officer, I'm going to tell you, if you were to ask them and they didn't think they were being recorded, I think uh, the Prince said he's maybe higher. No, he's still working with them, so I'm not sure. But uh, I think a lot of, you know, I know that they think it's a waste of time. And I know the guys that, that I used to work with that are still on a job used to get pretty ticked off. You had a dispatcher going, any car this, any car that, any car that. And they stop somebody if they have a minute before we give a minor violation. They just want to chat with them and say, hey, straighten up before you get in an accident or something. And everything else is legal, no matter what neighborhood you're in. But they had to open the car and they go, oh, gee, you know, I got, you know, I had to, I had to take this this little stick and put it in a bag, and, and in those days, take you downtown, put you in jail, and put your little stick in a bag and put a seal on it and sign the seal and process it, sign it in, all that. I'm off the street for an hour and a half. 
because you did a dumb move with your car and you had, you know, one joint on your person and uh, you had a warrant for not being a traffic ticket or something, you know. And it's really it's kind of irritating to the guys that are out there. They want to do what cops are for. Answer the call. I said that before. My probably two of my best friends till this day, my old chief of police, my old partner, kid down was his field training officer back in nineteen eighty five. I hate to admit that. Um, the, my old, uh, old partner, he's still a police officer, and he would tell you absolutely marijuana is the biggest waste of time. He doesn't enforce it at all. He's back in patrol because he's about to retire and he wants to work as much overtime as he can to up his retirement numbers. Um, but he was a detective for years. Now back in patrol, he didn't do anything in terms of enforcing marijuana laws. If he pulls somebody over, you know, he, he, he calls it, he's in that last three years, he calls it NATZ, no arrest time zone. And so he never was big on marijuana laws anyway. I remember my, between my first and second year of law school, I went back and worked on the police department because it was decent money. I took a one year leave of absence, didn't know if I was going to like law school. I didn't, but I went back anyway. And went back and worked that summer as a cop. And my partner and I are riding around in the car and we drive by a restaurant, Uno's Pizzeria, Portland, Maine, and there's a car behind the restaurant and you can see a glow. So we park back, we walk up, and we look in and there's a guy sitting there, four guys sitting in the car, and one guy sitting with a ball in his phone. I go, he goes, <laughs> Rolled down the window. I said, "All right, everybody out. So give me your bong, bowl, marijuana." We set all up on the. They probably had quarter ounce. Put up on the roof of the car. What are you guys doing? We work from the Uno's. We're on our. We're on our break. We're just smoking a little weed. I said, "I get it." So Mike and I said to Mike, "Get in the car." And he's like, "What?" I said, "Get in the car." He's like, "It's in the car." I get in the car, and we drive off. We're driving through the parking lot. And they're standing there looking this like, <laughs> I pull back around, I pull up and I look around and I go, you guys better get the shit off the roof of that car for the police come. <laughs> so we drove away. <laughs> About a month later we're in that peach where you know, having lunch. We work the night shift. And these two guys come and they go, are you guys cops? <laughs> and they go, these are the guys we were telling you about. I swore to God, tell them the story. They didn't take our shit. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and of course, they tell me all their friends, these cops didn't take our stuff. I mean, they were floored by it. They just couldn't live there telling everybody, and nobody believed them. And of course, we're looking, I'm going, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I think most police officers, because I think like the lieutenant said, the problem is, and especially the city of St. Louis, you got real crime here. You got real crime. These police officers are out there trying to answer gun calls, stabbing calls, domestic violence calls. And all of a sudden you got some, you know, guys sitting there driving home, you know, going to go home and smoke a joint with his wife that night. Kind of goes into gives the shit category in the real scheme of things. Um, and I just think most police officers, but I, but I think the sergeant's right, or the lieutenant's right. I think more and more because now we're baiting police officers now with cameras and I think somebody said there were two senators or something, somebody in the car. I mean, that's a problem because we're putting police officers in a position that they're going have to have to take action. Um, but, and, and it's interesting, this, this mix between the feds and the state. You know, when the state says we're not going to, we're going to decriminalize it, the feds are saying, well, we're still going to make arrests. But the good thing is the feds have a minimum threshold. The deal is you got to get the, you know, it's the profit that's in this thing. That's what's going to drive the, the, the black market and drugs, and it always has and it always will. And until you deal with that, you know, somebody said to me, well, the problem is we can't tax marijuana. I said, why couldn't you tax marijuana? They said, well, people can grow it themselves. I said, shit, people can grow tobacco to themselves, but I don't know anybody doesn't buy cigarettes at a gas station. <laughs> people are lazy. You can distill liquor yourself too. I don't know anybody that's got a still in their basement. It's a little easier for weed, I understand, but 
you're really going to do good stuff, hydroponics, get rid of male plants, good female plants, bigger, fatter buds, all that good shit. You're going to sell it. People are going to buy what's best. And they can tax it. Absolutely. Run just like you have a, almost like a state liquor store. They could do it, and they're doing it in other states. But I think it's coming. All right. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes left on this panel, uh, and I wanted to get uh, some of you guys' questions. Uh, so if you have a question, uh, and specific, if you have it uh, addressed to one specific panelist, uh, please say who that is, but uh, otherwise you can just go ahead and ask. Sure, back like that. Mr. Ryan, we're having a big issue in Illinois with HB1, and the biggest problem we're having with our reps is that they want to address the DWI issues. Do you have any suggestions? Also, HB1 is the medical marijuana bill in Illinois, yes. correct? Right? You know, I can't really decide, uh, but I think I'm in a friendly group, so I'll offer an opinion that I think that's kind of a ruse. I don't think uh, anyone has actually established what constitutes under the influence in terms of marijuana use. You finally figured out that because it's in their system 28 days doesn't mean that three weeks later you're under the influence. But uh, they realize that uh, it lasts, if you actually get a little bit high, it lasts. Uh, the attorney might know more about that than I do, but just, just a few hours, quite similar to alcohol, basically, and then you're not under the influence anymore. And I like to tell people because it's a little bit funny, but it's kind of true. If somebody gets really high with marijuana, they don't want to go out. They just want to chill. You know, they're kind of afraid to go out, actually. But maybe they run out of Cheetos or something. And so they decide, I'm going to, I'm going to make a run to the nearest 7 Eleven. I hope nobody catches me. And uh, those would be the guys that stop 50 feet behind the stop sign and sneak up on it. So uh, dangerous drivers, I'm not sure. I don't think they quite have the science yet. But if and when they do, I'm sure this guy will be one of the first ones to, to remind everybody about the burden of proof. And I think it's going to take a while to get that science right. I think uh, they're working on it, but I don't think they quite have it yet. So. There, there is no set level of nanograms where there's a presumptive level of impairment. In other words, for alcohol, they came up with this bullshit number 0.08, and it's total BS, okay? There, there's a challenge right now even about that, because what happened when I got this business, 0.15. I mean, my police dog used to, with a 0.15, my police dog would go, that guy's drunk. <laughs> <laughs> point, and then it went to 0 0.10, and then arbitrarily they went from 0 0.10 to 0 0.08, and there's not one study that shows anything that NITS has put out that talks about the life-saving and the difference between 0 0.10 and taking it to 0 0.08. Nothing. It was forced down the throats of states because they said, if you don't do it, we're going to take away your matching highway funds. That's how they got it passed, 0 0.08, all over the country. But they, but they came up with this arbitrary number saying if you're over 0.08, it's presumed that you're under the influence of alcohol. With marijuana, there is no set level of nanograms for delta-9 THC to be able to say you're high in your bloodstream. Part of this is because they can't determine whether you smoked dope three days ago, whether you did it four days ago, whether you did it two hours ago. It's hard for them to tell based on just a, a pure level of nanograms. For some of the marijuana cases that also in DRE cases, drug recognition experts, where they're arresting for driving under the influence of marijuana. The interesting thing is they, they'll take a urine sample when they suspect marijuana, which is ridiculous because once something's in your urine, it can't be making you high. Once something moves into the bladder, it's technically outside of the body. It cannot be affecting your central nervous system. You're not high if it's in your urine. They should be taking blood samples. All right, and then based on that blood sample, even then, I mean, I had a case, I tried a driving under the influence of marijuana case. My client was a, a manager of one of the gentlemen's establishments on, in, I call it Western Illinois. Um, and he had smoked a joint about five o'clock that evening, about half a joint, he said. About two hours later, he went to work, he worked all night, and the next day he got off, it was about one o'clock in the afternoon, he drive it home. And a trooper pulls him over, asks him, arrests him for driving under the influence of marijuana. As I point out to the prosecutor, if you smoke a half a joint at 5 o'clock in the evening, if you're still high the next day at 2 in the afternoon, there'd be a line up that drug dealer's door for that shit. <laughs> That's good stuff. It happened. 
And so what they do is they do what they call this drug recognition. It, it, and one of the other, I just spoke at a prosperous conference, and one of their big complaints is about driving under the influence. But I, wanna, I said, look, it just requires the police officer to be police officers. Investigate. If you think the person's under the influence of marijuana and they're driving, and it's affecting the ability to safely drive, then be a police officer. Work the case. The problem is they've come up with this thing called the DRE, Drug Recognition Expert, and it's total voodoo. I just went out to Lexington, Kentucky, to debate the three L.A. cops who developed this course, and now it's sweeping the nation. Drug recognition experts, especially trained police officers, they go through a 12-step protocol. And after this, these cops say, they then categorize you in one of seven categories of drugs. They do this, and it's a series of, they take your blood pressure, they take your heart rate, they look under your tongue, they look to see if you have ejection sites, they take your heart rate again, your blood pressure again, and they give you four standardized field sobriety tests. And it's always funny when I get the ones they say, he had six out of six clues on the horizontal gaze nystagmus test. And it's, it's, it's just hilarious because marijuana does not cause nystagmus. Alcohol does, but not marijuana. And so you should, if you don't have six out of six clues, it ain't weed, you're saying. But, so what they do is they go through this drug recognition category. 12-step protocol, then they go, okay, narcotic analgesic, I think, are the influence of, or central nervous system stimulant or symptom nervous system depressing, or hallucinogen. They come up with one of the categories. And when I told these, there were 600 prosecutors there. The LAPD cops spoke first. They were all morning. I got in the afternoon, and I stood up. The first thing I said was, everything they just said is bullshit. <laughs> I said, if, if you can send me, anyone here in this room, send me one case. You send me a case where a police officer arrests somebody through a drug recognition protocol, goes to the 12-step category, and they classify the drug, and then they send it for a lab result, and it comes back and confirms that you've got what they say the drug is, and the, before the lab result comes back and confirms, and the person didn't admit to using any drugs, or they didn't find any drugs, I'll give you $1,000 for every one of them. You send me five cases, I'll send you a check for $5,000. The prosecutors are broke as shit, so I know they want to take advantage of that. Never, not one phone call by gotten call phone. It's always a situation where they pull you over, they say she has slurred speech, bloodshot watery eyes, failed to maintain a single lane, and I did my 12 step protocol, and I think she was under a central nervous system depressant, and she had a bottle of Vicodin in her pocket and admitted to taking two Vicodin. Duh. <laughs> or they find marijuana in the ashtray, they find her ashtray, Looks like Cheech and Chong's been pulled over, the weed smoke's coming out, and the guy says, I've been smoking dope all night. And they go, hmm, think he's going to to marijuana. <laughs> it's, it, the driving under the influence, the way they're doing it's ridiculous. They need to get back to this old-fashioned police work. You pull a guy over, instead of this BS about weaving within your lane, everybody weaves within their lane. You know, is the person in an accident? Have they driven off the road? Are they driving over the center line? Have they almost hit another car? Are they driving like they're not driving safe? Then get them out and go through, do the field sobriety test properly. Know how to do them. Pretty the problem is police officers don't know how to do the test. Is there any police officers in here? I guarantee you, I ask you about the horizontal gaze and I have a question about the horizontal gaze and I stand this test and you won't answer them right. Anybody? Very good chicken. Um, it is, um, they just don't know how to do the field sobriety test correctly. It's just bad police work. I've never lost a DWI drugs case to a jury, never not once. Because they put these guys up and they say they're drug recognition experts. A lot of lawyers file motions to keep them from being called experts. Not me. I said, let them call them an expert all day long, build them up because then I stand up, pull down their pants, and punch them in the mouth. <laughs> I say to him, by the time I'm done, the last guy I had, I said to him, you're no expert, are you? He goes, no, sir, I'm not. <laughs> he couldn't answer any questions. It's unbelievable. So if they're going to try, and if the concern is driving them to impaired, you can prove driving while impaired cases. You can do it now. It has nothing to do. If that's the concern, then outlaw, then outlaw alcohol. They tried that. <laughs> well, and they didn't work so well. And then this isn't working so well for me, either. All right, we have time for maybe one more question. 
Go there. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, do you think um, the American public would have bought into this wholly, the war on drugs, um, if it, there hadn't have been, um, it hadn't been framed to combat something outside? What I mean is the Central American cartels in the 80s, that was how it was sold to the American public. Do you think they would have bought into it if they would have realized at this point they, they declared war on their children and grandchildren? I mean, I mean, do you think the psychology plays into that at all? Because, I mean, for for some addicts or some people who use uh, marijuana out of spite, almost um, it seems, um, because it's been declared on them, and it seems like it's more pride at this point. Like they don't want to see reason. I, I'm I'm not sure. Like. Um, I guess it's a personal question. Do you think that that, because there, there seems to be a divide in the way us and them, the police speak of us, they're citizens, they say them, and then they refer to themselves as us, the police force. Do you think that if that was uh, addressed, it, it would maybe maybe help the police to see it from... So, so basically you're, set, you're asking if uh, the, the mentality has become that the police are actually waging a war Yes, that's, American thank citizens. you, John, thank you, that's okay. why you're the director. Yeah. Hey, who wants to handle that one? At least part of the answer is having been alive and a young kid at the time that these things were happening. It wasn't perceived as a war against your children, it was perceived against the predators of your children. And the parents, for the most part, while they all drank alcohol, had no real experience with drugs. So it was an easy sell. This is a foreign substance that's harming your children. There was very little medical backing. There, it was emotional at the time. You know, as to the, the war, I mean, from a federal standpoint, yeah, they see themselves as knights in, in armor going out to protect people from, and the federal government tends to go after the larger gangs, the, the larger, but that's by no means an absolute. So. I mean, from the federal standpoint, they, they look at it, I think, differently than, than the street officer does because they, they've sold themselves that they're going after the cartels, they're going after the large violent gangs, and you know, we bought into the psychology that we're, we're fighting bad people and not ourselves. 